morning. I want to begin by thanking Nathan and the elders for this opportunity to preach. It is, it is always a joy to me to open up God's word with God's people. So I'm thankful very much for the opportunity here this morning. This place where we're gathered right now currently is approximately 6,200 miles away from Jerusalem. 6,200 miles from Jerusalem. And I wonder if you think that's a long distance. In our modern age of uh, airplanes taking off and landing all the time, oh, you can travel 6,000 miles in less than a day. Get on an airplane right now, you'll be in Jerusalem by, by tomorrow. And with our communications, we can communicate with someone in Jerusalem in the blink of an eye. You can turn on your phone or some internet app and you can talk to someone in Jerusalem right now. So 6,200 miles may seem like a small distance to us given our modern technologies, but consider this. It took 1,800 years, that's 1,800 years, for news to travel from Jerusalem to this part of the world. What news am I thinking about? Of course, I'm thinking about the all-important news that God has visited humanity in the man, Jesus of Nazareth, and that he was crucified, and that on the third day, he was raised back to life. Now, that is some news that somebody can provide forgiveness for you and has triumphed over death and can offer to you eternal life. Well, there were witnesses to this great event. And those witnesses, they wanted to get the word out. And they spread the word all around Jerusalem and out to surrounding areas. And nonetheless, despite their zeal and their eagerness to spread that message, it took 1,800 years for news to reach what is now called Indianapolis. In fact, the first organized Christian gathering, of which we have a record, was held in this area in 1819, when it was still called the Fall Creek Settlement, an outpost for fur traders. Settlers had been here for a while, but it was in 1819 when a Methodist named Rezin Hammond conducted the first Christian worship service under some walnut trees. Are any of these walnut trees? Well, there you go. This is just like the first gathering in the Fall Creek Settlement. At any rate, a couple years later, on October 9th, 1821, the first church, a Methodist church, was established. And their first pastor was an itinerant preacher named Reverend William Cravens. Cravens actually established and preached in many churches all over Indiana. According to Cravens' biography, quote, The country was then new. The inhabitants sparse. The fair poor. The roads intolerable, streams with few bridges, and yet he went forth in pursuit of the sheep in the wilderness, in danger of perishing. The love of Christ constrained him. His biography goes on, quote, Mr. Cravens belonged to that class of ministers not afraid to swim rivers, to climb mountains, to sleep in the woods, facing every enemy, facing, fearing no danger. In 1821, he was sent to organize the circuit to be called Indianapolis. A few Methodist families had settled at different points on the White River in the vicinity of Indianapolis, and the conference sent Mr. Cravens to take care of the few sheep in the wilderness and to plant the institutions of religion in the young but promising state. He was just the man for the enterprise. He was zealous and fearless and indefatigable, which means never fatiguing, preferring death to the neglect of duty. On horseback and alone, he threaded his way through the wilderness, from the settlements on the Ohio to those on the White River. The streams were swollen by the recent rains, and it was difficult to cross. In attempting to ford Sugar Creek, he was swept from his horse and carried down the stream. His horse reached the bank on the opposite side in safety, and a man who had settled in the vicinity at an earlier day, seeing the horse come out of the creek without its rider, hastened down to the bank to see what was the matter. He states that when he arrived at the bank, he saw a large middle-aged man crawling out of the water upon the limbs of a tree that had fallen in the stream. And as he got on the trunk of the tree, he heard him soliloquizing and saying to himself, well, bless God, I would go to heaven if it were Sugar Creek all the way. Said the backwoodsman, I reckon you will get there. It seems you be in the right way. A man who could praise God in the midst of such trials, would be likely to succeed in his mission. 
and save his own soul. No wonder the backwoodsman admired his heroism. He would have made a splendid martyr. Well, as one such man, and many like him, who established churches and witnesses to the gospel in this region of the world long before our modern technologies ever came along. And thus, the gospel came to what we now call Indianapolis. But why is it that Christianity should be established in this part of the world? How is it that the gospel, a set of the news of a set of events that happened in Jerusalem, 6,200 miles away, nearly 2,000 years ago, should travel so far, even though it took a long time for it to reach here? I ask because there are a lot of news stories that aren't worth telling your neighbor about. There are a lot of religions and philosophical movements that never make it down the street. History is littered with great ideas, potential movements, and the next big thing that never make it more than one or two generations. But why should Christianity, why should the gospel of Jesus of Nazareth travel such as, uh, with such success? And why should we, far removed in space and time from Jerusalem, organize our lives around this gospel in 2020? In other words, how do we get here? And where is here? And where are we going? Our passage for today is in Isaiah 49. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 49 will answer these questions for us. And my hope for today's message is that you will be dumbfounded by the impossibility of world missions, and yet at the same time be all inspired by God's sovereign work in world missions. That you will be dumbfounded by the impossibility of world missions, and in the same breath, all inspired by God's sovereign work in world missions. So let's read Isaiah 49. I'll read the first six verses. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me like a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing in vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. In order to be dumbfounded by the impossibility of world missions and all inspired by God's sovereign work in missions, we need to see three things from this passage. Number one, we need to think about who is speaking, who is speaking in this passage, what is he saying, and who's listening. Who's speaking, what's he saying, and who's listening. Number one, who's speaking? Well, it's someone called the servant. Did you notice that in verse three? He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So there's this figure in Isaiah called the servant, and he's identified in verse 3 as Israel explicitly. But if you look at verse 5, the Lord says to the servant that he will bring back Jacob, that Israel might be gathered to him. In other words, the servant is Israel, but the servant also has a ministry to Israel. So he's Israel, but he's also serving Israel. So what's, what's going on here? How can, how can he be Israel and yet also have a ministry to Israel? Well, it looks like this. Israel, in God's economy, 
is called to be a witness to the greatness of Yahweh. That's why they're set aside, set apart from the nations and put in the land, that they might testify to the great things Yahweh has done among them and thereby tell the nations, this is the true and living God, you're worshiping false gods. Because your false gods, they have eyes but can't see, they have hands but they can't save, they have mouths but they can't speak. They're idols. And so the nations might see their own false gods, see what Yahweh, the true and living God, is doing among Israel, abandon their false gods, and come join Israel. That's Israel's mission in the world. A few chapters earlier in Isaiah, he says this, chapter 43. All the nations gather together, and the peoples assemble. Who among them, who among the nations, can declare this, or show us the former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses and prove them right. Let them hear and say, this is true. But you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know me and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no one formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. You've seen what I do in my acts of salvation. Now, go tell others. And let the nations tell about their gods too. What does their testimony sound like? Sadly, however, Israel became false witnesses. They have perjured themselves in their testimony. Because they lived as in a way as to suggest that Yahweh is really no different than the other gods. It's very sad. And therefore, they're driven out of the land. They're driven out of the land of Israel. They are sent into exile. But exile will not be the last word. And so the rest of Isaiah is about the coming of another servant to fulfill where Israel fell short. A new servant who will bring the people of Israel back out of exile. Bring them back and create a new servant. To bring his people out of exile. And this time, this new servant will be empowered by the Holy Spirit, who in turn gives his Holy Spirit to his people. So in Isaiah 44, I will pour the water on the thirsty land, the streams on the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants, thereby making them true witnesses in the new age to Yahweh's exclusive divine glory. It's all about the preservation and the propagation of God's glory, that he alone is God, and he will share his renown, his fame with no one. That's the job of the servant. Look again at verse 3. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified, to declare God's glory to the nations once again. And so this servant is talking about his mission. So the servant is the one speaking, the one who identifies with Israel and also saves Israel. And so he's speaking about his mission. Well, what's he saying about his mission? Look at verse 4. He's talking about his failure. He's talking about his failure in the mission. But I have said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing. And vanity. So at first, the servant reflects upon his ministry and finds himself a failure. He doesn't reclaim Israel. He doesn't have the fruit and success that he expects. But then, he turns his lament into success. Look at verse 5 and following again. Now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations. By my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. In other words, the Lord tells the servant, your job is bigger than you realized. It won't be enough if you can gather up the Jewish exiles. You will take this message of the exclusive glory of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and take it to the nations as well. To appreciate this 
and to appreciate the impossibility and awe-inspiring nature of it, I think you have to appreciate a little bit more of what it was like for Israel to be found in exile, to be kicked out of the land. I'm sure you can, you can wrap your mind around the devastating reality if you're kicked out of your home and taken somewhere else, but, but think a little bit more with me for a moment. Imagine that the other 49 states declared war on Indiana. Now, why would they do that? They want our corn and maple syrup and basketball players, I don't know. But the other 49 states declare war on Indiana, okay? And they conquer Indiana, and they take a third of you to be imprisoned on the campus of University of Michigan. They take a third of you to be imprisoned on Ohio State's campus. Now, for those of you who would enjoy spending time at Ohio State, they take you to Michigan. Those of you who'd like to go to Michigan, they take you to Ohio State, okay? And they take another third of you, and they scatter you all over the other 49 states. They just scatter you all around. So every single Hoosier is displaced, and the community of Hoosiers is dismembered, spread out all over the country. And then Governor Holcomb comes to you and says, I got a job for you. I got a job for you. You are going to go out there and bring back all those lost Hoosiers. You would say, okay, uh, what kind of resources are you going to give me for this mission? And Holcomb says, no, 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 wait a second. We'll talk about that in a minute. I, that was only part one. You're going to go out there, you're going to get everyone, but you're also going to convince the other 49 states to stop their hostility. You're going to create peace with them. Okay. Again, Governor Holcomb, what... What resources are you gonna are you gonna supply for me? Uh, what can I use to this end? I said, like, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. I got one more thing for you. You're gonna go out there and you're gonna reclaim everybody. You're gonna bring them back. You're gonna create peace with the other 49 states, and you're gonna convince those 49 states to become Hoosiers themselves. Okay, so you want me to go out and get everybody who's been scattered all over the country. You want me to create peace and end the war with the other 49 states and convince them to see the error of their ways that they in turn become part of the society that they tried to annihilate. Now, what kind of resources do you have for me to accomplish this daunting mission? And Governor Holcomb says, words. You'll have words. You can convince them simply with your words. And that is the means and the mission of this servant. Look again at verse 49, verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me. And speaking of his mouth as a sharp sword is an easy image to understand that when it cuts, it accomplishes its mission. It's not a dull edge. It's got to work extra hard to make the cut. It's a sharp sword. And to say that it's hidden in his hand is to say, the Lord is holding me back for just the right time, at which time, there will be a cut from my mouth and an effective slice to accomplish what my word goes out to accomplish. This is the same image with the, with the polished arrow. If you have an arrow with burrs on it or any kind of imperfection, it won't fly straight. It'll, it'll wobble and it'll veer off to the side, much like your golf stroke, or at least mine, right? And so a polished arrow makes sure that it goes straight. And so again, this arrow is being hidden in the quiver of the Lord, ready to be shot, bam, to hit its target. That's the efficacy of the word that will be in the mouth of the servant. In fact, this is a theme throughout the book of Isaiah. And some of our most famous statements about the power of the word of God is in this section of Scripture. Just a few chapters earlier, chapter 40, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but... The word of our God stands forever. 
Or a little bit later, chapter 55. So shall, but, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which it is sent. I think every Awana kid knows those verses. It's throughout this section of Isaiah that when the time is right, the servant will come, and when he speaks, he will gain the desired end of his speaking. Such is the power of the word that comes forth from the servant. And so to summarize, Israel is conquered by the surrounding nations. No imagination anymore. That's what happened. And they were displaced and scattered all over the known world. And Isaiah said, when the servant par excellence comes, he's being hidden in the quiver of the Lord right now. But when the Lord releases him, he will accomplish his mission. As daunting as it seems, he will bring them back. He will recreate the people of God. And the nations who have been worshiping false gods at that time will look up and they'll say, what? The God of Israel is doing something for his people. He's saving them and speaking for them. And there's this story going around that their Messiah was raised back to life and he can forgive them and give them eternal life. What, what have our gods ever done for us? We pray to them. We beseech their wisdom. We ask them for deliverance. They, they're off playing games somewhere. Our, our gods are nothing. And they'll turn from their false gods. And come to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And join the new movement of the new witnesses under the leadership of the new servant. In fact, I would wager that every single person here has someone in their ancestry who worshipped the trees and the sun, the rocks, and the rivers. And you have someone else in your ancestry to whom the word of God came and convince them to turn from their idolatry and to worship the true and living God. So the servant is speaking about his daunting and impossible mission to the nations through his word. Who's listening? Anybody listening to this? Notice again in verse 1. To whom is this oracle addressed? It's not addressed to Israel. It's not even addressed to the servant or believers or whatever you might think. But verse 1, listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples, from afar. Some translations say, listen to me, O islands. This is the, Isaiah's way of describing those, those territories that are so far away from Israel. You never even think about them. Boats don't even go there. They're so far away. The furthest corner of the world. I'm talking to you out there. I'm talking to you out there. So the audience of Isaiah's oracle are the nations that had oppressed Israel. The bellicose, warring nations who tried to destroy Israel. Isaiah says, we'll forgive you and we'll save you through the coming servant. When you recognize your false gods and turn to our God. Now just think for a moment. Again, just think for a moment. You know where this is going. Jesus is the servant, okay? You know where it's going. But Isaiah is written 700 years before the coming of Christ. 700 years. And during that time, Israel is controlled by the Babylonians, and then the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then a, a group of people called the Seleucids, and then the Romans. And you could just imagine every single one of them hearing what's going on in the synagogue. Oh, they talk about this guy Isaiah and how someday we will bow down to their God. I mean, imagine yourself a Roman citizen at the time of Jesus, and you hear what's going on in the Jewish synagogues when they're reading Isaiah and the hope for the servant who's going to come. And the nations will abandon their false gods and bow down to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you hear this. You're just, you're just going to laugh. You're like, what are you talking about? The Roman gods are the greatest gods. Look, they, they're the ones who gave us this empire. They're the ones who created our army. 
There are all kinds of reasons to worship the gods of Rome or any other god that they might bow down to. And then it happens. What Brad read earlier happens. The consolation of Israel. Do you hear what he said? I caught it because I've been preparing this message. A light to the nations. When Jesus is born, Simeon calls him a light to the nations. And Jesus goes along, traveling along the road, calling out to people, come follow me. And when he calls them, they come. And they follow him. The sovereign word of God comes pouring out of his mouth in the Sermon on the Mount and in his parables and in his calling people to follow me. Leave your nets, leave your family, follow me. And then he dies on the cross to atone for sins. And he's raised on the third day. And now he gathers a people unto himself called the church, which becomes the new servant of the Lord, the new witnesses in the world. And so Jesus Christ is the servant of Isaiah 49, and by extension, the church is an extension of Jesus to the world to continue the witnessing testimony of the servant that there is one God and he has done great things, namely, raise Jesus from the dead. And so turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. After the resurrection, Jesus tells his followers, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Did you hear those terms? The Holy Spirit will make you witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so in the book of Acts, as you've been learning, in concentric circles, the gospel and the spirit are moving from Jerusalem out to the furthest corners of the world. Luke is telling you that in the book of Acts, the prophecy of, Jeremiah, of Isaiah 49 is coming to pass. Now the servant has come. Now the witnessing is happening. And Greeks and Gentiles and barbarians and, and, and Gentiles are turning from their false gods and worshiping Yahweh. This is the big idea of Acts. That the witness will succeed in taking salvation to the ends of the earth because the Spirit now empowers the church and God empowers his own word to make that happen. That's the point. Jesus is still working and still speaking through his people to accomplish what his word is going out for, which is taking salvation to the ends of the earth. In fact, in chapter 13, chapter 13, verse 47, Paul even quotes Isaiah 49. Acts 13, 47 For the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So God's glory spreads out in these concentric circles. And as it happens, nations see their false gods and they turn, they submit to Christ, they trust in him alone for forgiveness and salvation. And the growing movement, the church, the collection of spirit-filled witnesses, the quintessential place where God's glory is seen, is spreading to the ends of the earth. And the glory spreads, of course, through the sovereign progression of God's word. Look at the very next verse. Right after the quote from Isaiah 49, 6, in verse 47, this is 13, 47, now 13, 48, the very next verse. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. 
And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. Exactly as intended 700 years earlier. And so several times throughout the book of Acts, the word of God is spreading. The word of God is continuing. The word of God is growing. The word of God is increasing. You see it all over the place. So that by the end of the book, in chapter 28, Paul is in Rome, the heart of anti-gospel paganism and politics and propaganda and false religion. And it says he's, he's declaring the word unhindered. The last word of the book of Acts is unhindered. The implication is that even though the book of Acts is over, the story is over, nonetheless, the progress of the word of God will continue unhindered, even after Paul, even out to further parts of the world. Paul may be chained, but the word of God is not chained. So that God's glory can spread the gospel, and the church will continue. And it has continued. The spread of God's glory has continued. And the sovereign word of God has continued to increase. Even through terrible persecutions of the third century. Through the overrun of Europe by barbarians in the fifth century. Through the advance of Islam in the seventh and eighth centuries. Through the heretical accretions in the Middle Ages. Through divisions, factions, through fears and tears across a great ocean to arrive at the Fall Creek Settlement in the 19th century. The church is here in Indianapolis because the Creator God is zealous for the spread of His glory, intent that the entire world be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And He will see to that end by supernaturally empowering faithful speakers of His Word And preparing ears to hear so that salvation can reach the ends of the earth. So if you're a believer here today, Isaiah foresaw that in chapter 49 of his book. That the word of God will reach those far corners. Lands that no one had even heard of at that time. And all of this is accomplished with the spread of God's word that he empowers never to return void. And accomplish his God-glorifying mission. I can think of two points of application coming out of this. Number one, you should be thrilled as you continue through your series in the book of Acts. As you hear about the gospel going to towns like Berea and Corinth and Athens, I understand those are places you you may not know, but you at least know this. Those are Gentile cities. The Jewish apostles with the Jewish message of fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures by sending the Jewish Messiah is bringing salvation to the world and Gentiles are turning from their false gods and worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through the servant Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. That's just amazing. You don't read about that in the Old Testament. Yeah, Jonah goes to Nineveh and he leaves with his tail between his legs. But Paul is going out in, in power and going on And the churches are thriving after he's gone because he left them the word of God. It's a long time coming (laughs) since the time Isaiah laid down the oracle. And now it's happening. Second, join the mission. Join the mission of God's cosmic purposes to spread his name and renown to the ends of the earth. There is no place in all creation where God will not be glorified through a worshiping community. I don't know how long it takes sometimes. Apparently it takes at least 1,800 years to get this far. But this is not the end of the train line. There are still peoples in the world that do not have easy access to hearing the gospel. In other words, they don't have churches. Maybe they don't have Bibles in their language. They just go through their lives unaware of what happened in Jerusalem that many thousands of years ago. And if somebody is going to take the gospel to them, if the gospel is going to get to them, somebody 
has to cross physical boundaries, linguistic boundaries, and cultural boundaries. And so the kingdom of God is recruiting people who are brave enough and sacrificial enough and have enough faith in the oracle of Isaiah 49 and everywhere else where we read about this to go. To give up what's here and to go there. And I wonder if somebody right now isn't wondering, what am I going to do with the few lives I have on this earth that's going to make a difference in people's lives and in eternity? Someone said to me once, there are only two things that are eternal, the Word of God and the souls of human beings. This is someone who's thinking about, what am I going to do with my life? Well, you could be like Isaiah's servant. You could be like Paul. You can be like William Cravens, who sleeps in the woods who travels down the river to get the gospel to new places. Maybe that's you. If that sounds like you, talk to Nathan or Gus or Kelly. They would love to hear what you're thinking. But maybe you're at a point in life where that's just not, that's not you. Here's what I would encourage you to do this afternoon. If you have children who are 20 years or younger, I would encourage you to have a conversation with your spouse and ask your spouse, and let your spouse ask you the same question. How would you feel if our son, fill in the blank, or our daughter, fill in the blank, became a missionary? Now, I know there's a right answer. The right answer is, praise God, hallelujah, yes. Right, But no, no, I want you to think about it. I want you to think this child who we birthed, we cleaned, we clothed, we educated, we fed, we cleaned. I say clean twice. There's a lot of cleaning going on. How would we feel if they left? And we didn't see them but for once every other year. And they had grandchildren that we didn't see but once every other year, maybe, put in harm's way, don't know where their paychecks are coming from. When I told my dad I was going to seminary, he said, there's no money in theology. And I wasn't quick enough on my feet, but I should have said no, but there are great treasures. You see, he thought, man, after all the education I gave you, you could be part of the gross national product. And you're going to go think in a corner or whatever theologians do. He didn't, he didn't know. He didn't, he didn't know. But is that really the, the, the amount of our, is that, is that really the measure of our lives? Just, you know, get by in this society, have a nice, safe quadrant of the world to raise your kids and train your dog and, and your kids grow up and do the same thing. Why not make your home a missionary training camp? Talk about people like William Cravens or Adoniram Judson or any of the many gospel workers around the globe that you support and promote them as real celebrities. See, in our culture, we have this celebrity culture. Think about that word celebrity. Celebrity means one we celebrate. (laughs) What is there to celebrate about a lot of our celebrities? But people who cross boundaries... Borders, cultural, linguistic, economic, all kinds of boundaries to get the gospel to new people. Those are celebrities. They are worth celebrating. Have that discussion. Because William Cravens is a celebrity to me. And yet he did not bring the gospel to Indianapolis. He wasn't the principal actor. He was but the mouthpiece of the sovereign word of God. And going on now 2,000 years, Jesus has been gathering up his sheep through his sovereign word, bringing in the harvest, bringing in those exiled from God's presence because of sin. And we now are the new instruments in his hand, empowered by the Holy Spirit to participate in that witness to the ends of the earth. And so the mission is given to us in the end.
In Isaiah 49, we are the servant. We are the witness to bring the glory of God in the gospel to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Almighty God in heaven, that you would, that you would hear our prayer from Indianapolis. That we would give this prayer through Jesus was hard-earned and long-fought throughout history. Israel's history, Isaiah's history, European history, American history, Lord. But you have preserved your word and sovereignly delivered it to our ears. Where are the other ears that you are preparing? We pray that you would fill us with bravery and faith that we would go. In Jesus' name, amen.